Good evening, everybody. Uh, greetings from Brno, Czech Republic, or good morning if you are in Mexico or other parts of the globe. Uh, I would like to welcome you on this uh, online discussion meeting, which is dedicated to arms trade, drugs, and militarization in Mexico. My name is Susana and I'm a journalist uh, from Czech Republic. Uh, I work for a small online daily news organization called uh, Denig Referendum. And now I, I would like to invite um, head of Rosa Luxemburg Foundation uh, in Prague, uh, Joanna Gias, uh, Gias Detska? Ne. Uh, no, uh, sorry, sorry. I would like to invite you to uh, have a short remark on our uh, meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Susanna. Uh, I would like, um, in fact, um, um, to share with you only one remark. Yesterday, I read about the new contract on Hungarian government for the military aircraft. This achievement has an important impact on the economical position of Hungary in the region. Uh, a very well-known fact is that Czechia and Slovakia are advanced producers of weapons that would like to expand on new markets. The countries in the Central Eastern Europe attend to be international players in their arms right. Uh, a lot of questions are open and there is a big need for public debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm so sorry for spoiling your surname. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, what we are gonna talk about uh, today, um, in recent years, Mexico has been witnessing an unprecedented rise of violence Stories of murders, kidnappings, torture, and femicide are appearing in news more and more often. Responsibility for a large part of that could be ascribed to drug cartels, but neither Mexican police nor the military are guiltless. The whole world was shocked a few years ago when 43 students were kidnapped and subsequently murdered in the Guerrero state. Local police and military part took in committing this crime. And little known fact is the Czech Republic, uh, and the little known fact in the Czech Republic is that the Mexican police is armed also with Czech handguns. How is ongoing war on drugs and militarization of police fueling the violence in Mexico? And what does the role in the Czech Republic play? So these are the questions we will discuss today with our guests. And uh, first of them is uh, Montserrat Martinez. Um, can you show yourself and say hello? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Montserrat Martinez. So happy to be here sharing with yeah, you. So Montserrat Martinez is an independent consultant on conventional arms control and gender-based violence. And she has been working closely with uh, 24 Cero Horas Sin Violencia in Mexico, as a part of which she has been participating with the Control Arms Coalition and is a member of the global IA and SA Youth for Gun Control. And I would like to invite also Matthew Methaven. Can we see you, Matthew? Hi, it's Andrew. Yeah, Andrew Methaven. Uh, Hi. Andrew, sorry. <laughs> okay, no worries. <laughs> Problems with noise tonight, I'm sorry. <laughs> So Andrew is a coordinator of the nonviolence program at the War uh, Resistors International, and the program has been recently focused on the arms trade and police militarization. And then we have Hanna Svachinkova. Hello, Hanna. Can we see you, please? Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hello, Hanna. Hanna volunteers in Nesehnuti. Uh, Czech organization NGO where she devotes herself to arms trade, watch activities and topics such as youth militarization and the connection between militarization and gender. 
Yeah, and uh, now I think we are ready to uh, start uh, discussing and uh, remark from our, for our audience. Um, first, we will uh, discuss questions I've got prepared for, for our uh, participants, for our guests, panelists. And then after maybe um, 45 minutes, there, there will be also, also space for uh, questions from our audi audience. Uh, so um, everything will be ready and everybody will have their moment. Yeah. So I would like to start with question uh, for Montserrat. Um, Montserrat, would you like to introduce yourself and your work with explaining us how is it possible that Mexico became one of the most violent regions worldwide? In other words, what is the link between gun sales to Mexican police and the rise of violence there? in your country? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I must say that the uh, Mexican war on, on drugs, it's not like a single front, uh, like confrontation or war. It's not the violence that has been spreading all over the country in the last uh, 20, almost 20 years. It's like, is in the midst of a war on several fronts. On one hand, uh, we have like the army and the navy and well, these police corporations and forces and groups uh, again while well, fighting uh, like in an, in an open confrontation against uh, criminal groups. And on the other hand, we have like the disputes uh, between cartels and uh, for the control of the markets and communication communication routes and commodity producing territories and so well that's like the like a big picture of what is going on here in, in Mexico and how it started and how we like trying to systematize, systematize what is going on here but also we we found like there were regions in Mexico that um, they were already like really violent and they decided to def to self def well to start self defense, and uh, and that also like explode another area of confrontation and violence. And then if we if we like mix this all this all patterns, and also if we if we see well, Mexico is is a country like it's a huge problem of corruption and impunity. So uh, we we can see that there is like a mix and match, and uh, 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 so unfortunately, uh, context that rise up like a huge violence. For instance, the last like the last twelve years, it's been an increase on gender based violence, on armed gender based violence. There is an increase on not only on homicide rates but also on on, on femicide rates. So what is that for? It's because, well, there is a huge impunity and there is a message that we can like transcend violence and um, violence is permitted. And it's the like the legitimate, legitimate way to, to run in Mexico, not only by criminal, like criminal quarters or by the, the, the governmental forces, the, the the authorities, but also by any civil that it's that has access to access to to arms. So yeah, that's why it's important to look after like the not only well for for one for one hand the this this is strat, is strategy that he's that, that has been launched since two thousand six by by the Calderon's administration. But also it's important to look. Well, what is what is the line? What is what are the patterns that have been followed through the years, uh, and also they are they are still uh, on on these days, and that symbol, and it's very important to see like it, that symbol like a huge militarization process, and also a huge militarization uh, rise on expenses. So, uh, well, I, I must say that's like the, the general framework that we must say, yeah, the, the, that's why uh, violence has increased uh, all over the years, all over 20 years in, in Mexico. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, maybe Andrew, uh, Andrew, um, uh, you have written an article which has a title called When All You Have a Hammer, Everything Looks Like a Nail. Um, you discuss uh, rise of militarism in police and also in society in this article. Um, could you briefly explain why you think that police that is equipped by plenty of guns does not imply a safety, does not imply safety and peace in society? Um, could you give us this background maybe of what's also going on in Mexico in this context? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert in Mexico by any means at all, but um, I think that that phrase I find really useful for trying to understand, um, especially kind of heavily militarized policing, because um, just to say it again, the, the phrase is when all you have is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. And it's kind of suggesting if your only tool that you decide to use to deal with a problem is kind of heavily militarized violence, or if that's your primary tool, then um, then you start to use it in all sorts of ways that may be inappropriate or like don't meet the goal that you kind of want to meet. Um, and even perhaps your goal changes and you start to see the world through the lens of that kind of violence. Um, so at WRI we've kind of been looking at what militarized policing is because um, I suppose because um, we're, we're an anti-militarist organization, but, and for a very long time, we've been resisting kind of war in terms of between two states or between kind of two armed groups. But um, more recently, we've been talking about how militarism kind of permeates all of society and how that can kind of inform decisions being made by um, police forces or individuals or anyone who has a kind of militarized kind of outlook. Um, um, so, so that then impacts not just kind of kind of formal kind of state war, but um, any conflict where militarized violence is being used. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we kind of started, I, I guess, to try and try and look at what that looks like in different countries around the world and um, try and understand it a little bit and start to take action around it. Um, and I was, I was really kind of in that question around like why you've asked, um, you've asked why, why is police equipped with guns, not, not implying kind of safety and peace. And um, I was really, um, I was reading a, an article just yesterday about how um, the police forces in France really heavily responded to a protest by migrants in the middle of France who were protesting around their rights and access to, to asylum and things in France. And the police there reacted really aggressively and really violently. Um, and in response to that, the deputy mayor of Paris said, um, to think that we resolve social problems with truncheons is crazy, um, which I think sort of sums up the answer to that question for me. If you're using a truncheon or like a baton or any other kind of weapon um, as a response to a social problem, and that's like your primary means of responding to that problem, then... Um, you're sort of missing the point, <laughs> I guess. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, yeah. No, thank you for this contribution. Maybe I would like to quickly jump back to Montserrat and ask uh, you whether this sounds like something you know from your country, whether that describes uh, your- Yeah, of course. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I feel very related of, of what, Andrew just said because uh, recently, just uh, two weeks ago, it was a protest in Cancun, which is a very touristic place in, in Mexico. It was a femi uh, feminist pro uh, protest against femicides and against uh, any kind um, against the lack of uh, of action from governments to stop femicides and the, the huge rate of femicides in Mexico. And the police responded with uh, with open fire. And uh, it was like, if we like, if that's the way we 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 find that we can, we can, yeah, that's, uh, if that's the way we, we find that 
solutions must be addressed and the and a social problem must be addressed. I think it's like if it, that's the only way we we find to 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 respond to any social phenomena, I think well we have to start changing from the, the beginning of the perspective of what is going on and what needs to be addressed. For instance, in Mexico, like the the the, the like the whole strategy on the war against drugs and also criminality. What are the causes? What is going on among our communities and our societies? I mean, and and yeah, I feel very related. I mean, it's a feminist process, a protest against femicides, against impu against impunity, against the lack of uh, institutional response to to what is going on, why women are 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 murdered and why are disappear and why are treated with such a violent uh, response. And uh, I think it's a legitimate. Well, of course, it's a legitimate uh, protest. And it's kind of, of 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 awkward and also really it's a really great threat to the whole Mexican population and anyone uh, that lives here that know that your authority will respond with open fire against you. So yeah, I think it's a really uh, great problem from the roots. Yeah, thank you. Maybe. Uh... To jump back to uh, also back here to Brno where I'm sitting in the Czech Republic, I would invite uh, Hannah to connect uh, this whole uh, Mexican and international context uh, with uh, what we have here. And um, I would like to hear from you, um, what is the Czech role in the whole phenomenon and particularly maybe also in the uh, arms trade uh, from the Czech Republic to Mexico. Uh, hi, uh, actually I'm not uh, in the Brno now, but <laughs> I'm in Czech Republic. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, well, as, as Andrew said, I'm also not uh, really uh, involved in the Mexico situation, but uh, I, I can uh, briefly tell you about the situation uh, on the Czech side. Uh, we know some really few uh, data we got from the Ministry uh, of Industry and Trade of Czech Republic. Uh, and uh, that's what we know about exports from Czech Republic to Mexico of uh, weapons and other military equipment. Uh, in the last 10 years, it reached 21 million uh, euros and uh, the trade peaked in uh, 2014 uh, when mostly small arms were exported, uh, valued at uh, 7.1 million euros. Uh, according to, to the Mexican army data, uh, Czech companies sold their uh, 7,904 firearms uh, to Mexico uh, for use by state and local police. That may, makes Czech Republic the sixth largest exporter uh, to Mexico uh, for uh, police firearm, firearms. Um, uh, also in 2014, Czech media reported that uh, Česká zbrojovka uh, or uh, CZ group, uh, in other words, uh, contract to equip an elite Mexican police a unit uh, in the new uh, division uh, of the federal police with 2,600 uh, assault rifles and 5,000 handguns. Uh, and uh, this sale uh, uh, was purchased uh, and it was around 7,600 uh, uh, firearms designed for the federal police and the state police of uh, Zacateca and Mont Morelos. Uh, uh, but uh, another data states that also in five in 2015 there was uh, four more than uh, four 
1,600 Czech rifles and pistols uh, went to Mexico. Uh, but the problem is that the Czech public and even politicians are uh, probably do not know about any of these sales and nor the human rights situation in Mexico. Till nowadays, the war on drugs uh, is poorly covered by Czech media. Uh, human rights crisis uh, or long lasting conflicts, including exports of Czech arms to uh, the countries where human rights are violated, seems not to be the topic for the mainstream media. And uh, also Czech politicians are not very interested uh, in both. So the opposite of this <laughs> is uh, standing uh, arms companies and the Ministry of Defense uh, who are promoting Czech arms uh, and their sales abroad heavily. And uh, media are celebrating the success of Czech companies. <laughs> so that, that's... <laughs> That's the situation, and uh, this is also the reason why the Czech Republic is also responsible for the uh, human rights violations as well in Mexico as in other countries. That sounds quite outstanding for a small country we are, I think. Um, maybe shortly, could you compare to the situation uh, uh, of our exports to other uh, countries? Uh, or my question would be whether uh, this is just some extreme, uh, I mean, between Czech Republic and Mexico, or are we a remarkable exporter internationally, I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, well, internationally, we are not really big exporter of uh, weapons and uh, arms, in, uh, but uh, uh, it's uh, notable to say that 90% uh, of all arms and military equipment, which is uh, 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 which is from Czech Republic, is exported. So pretty good um, amount of it. Uh, and in uh, 2019, it was uh, 619 million euros, the value of uh, exports, and. Uh, the problem is that we are exporting for the countries who are violating human rights, uh, not only Mexico, but as well, I can mention Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey, um, Vietnam, <laughs> Nigeria, and then other countries. And uh, I would say that the main problem is that uh, the industry uh, and the government are trying to uh, really uh, push these sales uh, and their argumentation stands on um, stands on uh, the security of uh, Czech people paradoxically because uh, they uh, argue that uh, when we are selling a lot then we can uh, improve uh, our own industry then Therefore, we can be really better uh, in uh, um, defending ourselves. And uh, also we are gaining new allies by uh, purchasing uh, uh, arms to another countries that we get loyal and potential business friends uh, elsewhere. So, um, uh, so yeah, and also the added value is often that, oh, we are selling uh, arms to uh, Egypt or Saudi Arabia. They are viola violating human rights of their own citizens as well. They are uh, violating, the, for example, the uh, human rights of the people in Yemen <laughs> and, and so on. But uh, they are arguing, okay, but they are stable, countries in the really good territory and they are always paying. So stable countries, we need these allies and that's it. Like, I would say that this uh, argumentation is not really uh, uh, sustainable. 
Yeah, that sounds really cynical. And uh, I wonder whether if we were again invaded by some kind of state uh, in future, whether that means that our politicians think that uh, we will be protected with, uh, by Mexico or Saudi Arabia. Anyway, uh, Monserrat, uh, uh, we are talking about uh, guns, guns and violence. And I would like to know uh, if you think that there is uh, some other way to stop the dangerous and bloody narco mafia than to equip police with more and more uh, firearms. I think uh, I, I will also want to add some comments about what just Hannah said, because it's important. Mexico and Czech Republic are part of the arms trade treaty. Uh, and they are uh, they have an obligation to report what they export and what they import are on, on small arms and, and other conventional arms. And uh, there is two things that I want to, to note about that. First of all, there is the Article 7 about export and, and export assessment, and it's a it, that in, that uh, that article states that um, uh, the export party that knows that there is a risk of, of of using the arms to commit any kind of of, of human rights violation or a gender-based violence or uh, uh, to spread gender-based violence, uh, is uh, they must be aware and they must stop and and like make a, uh, another assess uh, well risk assessment uh, evaluation to know what is going on with the with their, their exports. So I think it's really important for Mexico, for instance, uh, Mexico is the second larger consumer of, of small arms to uh, from Czech Republic. So I think it's really important to know that for instance, uh, uh, there is a huge uh, rate of, of losing arms amongst the pol uh, uh, the police corporations and they're also being reported like uh, stolen stolen arms so that's how uh, well we we have to to pay attention that's why we, we need to pay attention of what is going going on uh, between the the transfers and between this this kind of uh, well the commerce between between uh, Mexico and Czech Republic also because of the uh, there is a, a, an important part about uh, the end user certificate uh, this is a certificate that is uh, lent to know which are the like the final user, like uh, in the specific corporation that must be received the the shipment, and uh, as as far as we know in Mexico, that the 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 transfers are well are are um are signed by the by the military forces by the are uh, well yeah by the military forces by the military institution here the national military institution so it doesn't refer to any kind of corporation like for instance if that shipment will be uh, will be uh, directed to uh, police in Guerrero or in Jalisco, places where are, we have a huge uh, rates of violence. So that's important to know that what is going on because uh, for instance, if the, if, the, if the Czech authorities know to whom they are, uh, are selling the arms, well, it will be more easy from from for Mexico to know what is going on on this on this kind of like dynamic. So yeah, and um, that's what I wanted to address about uh, about this and also about there is a discrepancy about sometimes uh, uh, among the reports because every country has their their own reports uh, to the to the Secretariat of the Arms Trade Treaty. And uh, about that, there are also discrepancies about what we are acquiring in Mexico, what is acquiring, uh, uh, what is selling from from other countries, because we we identify the the, the merchandise and the and the, all the transfer and the shipments as different kind of of. of yeah, of merchandise. So I must say we have to 
uh, be c very careful of why it's being reported, uh, how these discrepancies are uh, filled out at the end of the day on our national authorities and our national government. So yeah, <laughs> that's one part I wanted to address. Yeah, thank you for adding this context to what Hannah has said. So you skipped my question, actually, and maybe um, just to uh, change the speakers for a while, uh, I was thinking that also Andrew could add something to that question, and so I will raise it again. And it was um, whether, uh, whether it is possible to stop the dangerous body uh, narco mafia in other by other means uh, than with uh, more and more firearms. So, Andrew, do you think you could maybe say something to this? Yeah, I can try. But again, um, like I said before, I'm not I'm not an expert in Mexican politics or anything going on there, really. So, yeah, no <laughs> It's a theoretical question, so it, there's no need to um, uh, direct it uh, to, to Mexico, but uh, mm. really. Maybe turning the question on its head a little bit, um, the other way of looking at it is to ask, will continuing to fuel that conflict with more and more weapons uh, lead to a resolution that's kind of peaceful and equitable? Um, and I would say, I, I would assume not, I guess, <laughs> and that's why I, I'm part of resisting the arms trade and part of resisting police militarization. Um, I kind of, um, that th there, are, there are two ways of thinking about peace, which I find quite helpful. One is um, the idea of negative peace and the idea of positive peace. And negative peace is the one where um, you don't have fighting, but you don't necessarily have like social justice or equality or these things. and maybe sometimes it's possible to achieve that by just overwhelming force, like just continuing to fight until somebody wins. Um, but that's not kind of a, a just peace. It's not kind of a secure peace and it's not, um, it's not a peace that necessarily meets people's needs. It's just a peace where people aren't fighting anymore. Um, and that's the kind of peace that's being promoted. And I think, that's the kind of piece you fight for, I guess. Um, but uh, a kind of positive piece is one where there's kind of the the needs and the the problems that have been um, fueling the conflicts in the first place are met. Um, and um, yeah, I, again, I don't know about Mexico enough specifically to say, but th that's the kind of piece we have to be thinking about if. Um, yeah, we want a just just world, and that's not the kind of peace that you achieve by just yeah buy more weapons. I'm sure. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, maybe Montserrat, do you want to follow? Yeah. Uh, also about uh, what Andrew said about uh, uh, social justice. I think it's important because this is uh, enforced and strengthened strengthened by the a whole system you know not only the exports well for for one side we have like the legal transfer and also the the the, the illegal transfers and and trafficking but also we'll have like from the legal from the legal transfers we have like this problem of diversion that we don't really know what is going on with these arms that are being transferred and which corporation are receiving and uh which are the the like we who, who are the, the the people that are using this these arms yeah for, that's what from one side from the other like inside we have like a big problem of a lack of control of of of, of for instance um for shipment for uh, like we we don't have control for instance when when a police officer takes their arm to the well they're gone to to their home uh, we don't have like these controls because well if it, it, it also allows uh, gender-based violence in their own homes in their own uh, yeah 
So and on in your family, in your community. So like it's a really um complex problem for one side. And also we have like this part of impunity and corruption. And I think it's an important part because sometimes like we find out that police officers are are obliged to to lend their arms or to rent their arms to criminal to make any well to any criminal that wants to make any criminal acts and then they are back so we don't have like that register of what is going on in between you know and also uh yeah so i think it's a big problem of of of, of like this huge increase on on arms transfer on military expensive on the view where it's going on in Mexico and also of, of how we we understand what uh, what justice means if that means that incarceration if that, if that means for instance the whole system has allowed to increase the rates of, of torture or to extrajudicial executions so uh if that's the, the role that the authorities want to play uh, around the, the civilian population, I think that's a, view, a huge problem. So that's why uh, I think it's like a whole system and it's strengthened by, for instance, for legislations that allows uh, monk uh, deployment of military activities uh, within civil, within civil uh, or um institutions and also uh the, the their tasks that the the ta their tasks that are being asked to to perform the military authorities and also the militarization of police uh, corporations and also if we like we understand that we need to to inflict this kind of harm in order to to safeguard the the peace in Mexico, so it's kind of, of, of a twisted uh, mindset, I must say. And that's why this kind of, of legislation allows also that uh, if, if, we, if we incarcerate people, for instance, and if there is a, no a previous investigation going on and we incarcerate it in order to start investigations, there's a whole new twist of what is going on with human rights from the from the inside of the of the state not only like around criminal uh, gangs and what is illegal like these illegal markets is around the state to their own citizens so it's i think that's why it's like a really important to try to change the whole framework of what are allowed? What the authorities are allowed to do? What are the authorities are? What are the the tasks that are are being asked to perform? And what also as society, what we want from them? And it's important for us to like to raise the voice. For instance, about the sorry that I take all over again, but the feminist protest has been really criminalized here in the country, and I. Uh, it's been like a, a a large response on on like in a very uh, restrictive way uh, from the authorities, and that's the way like they address everything here. So, and o not only by by the like the the moment of the confrontation uh, when the protest is going on, but also uh, to invest uh, about like the investigations about what is going on with these feminine, uh, feminist activists uh, or the people that I like like uh, trying to uh, give an impulse on, on this movement of feminists here in Mexico. So why the people, the citizens are also uh, are targeted uh, as the enemy. So I think it's like a huge uh, complex situation. Yeah, um, just maybe if you could quickly um, say a few words about two things you mentioned, and that's extrajudicial killings and torture, because that's something we don't, uh, we are lucky not to have in, in our country and not to experience here. So um, how does that happen? 
and uh, who's like usually behind these um, uh, terrible um, crimes? Well, there is uh, there is the, the the legal system that allows this kind of, of, of practices, and also it's because there are teach around the the corporations, the security corporations. First of all, uh, torture. For instance, there is a measure, a judicial measure that it's called arraigo here in Mexico that it's allowed at a, at a constitutional level. And it's for those uh, for those who are suspected of, of being involved in criminal uh, in criminal yeah, conducts, you know, like uh, on, crim on criminal organized groups. So uh, that measure allows to take in prison, to take someone to prison before it's an, investi an investigation going on. Investigation, uh, yeah, because uh, before a prosecutor is like leading an investigation to people, and uh, yeah, and that figure is started on two thousand eight, when, and it's kind of uh, uh, it's kind of curious because. The whole system in Mexico changed from uh, since 2008. Exactly, the the legal system in Mexico or how must be led a prosec a prosecutor uh, process. So uh, and also here in Mexico we have an important reform on on human rights since 2011. So it's kind of twist like we have still these kind of measures that. Um, these measures uh, are based on the testimony of the of the people that is incarcerated to uh, start like the investigate investigative process. So, uh, if you are based on the testimony of the person and you incarcerated first, then there is a huge probability that will that torture will be committed in order to 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 get that confession. You know that confession you know to 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 start all over the the, the the process and also for instance for the for the uh, extrajudicial uh, extrajudiciary uh, executions uh from 2006 till 2013 there was uh we well uh there was informed uh, uh, to the population that there was a rates of of the people that were uh, were killed or well were, yeah dead uh, in a crossfire in a crossfire incident but also uh, that they were identified as criminals in a, in an a specific like event of 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 um, violence among uh, army or among police forces and criminal groups and uh, but suddenly in 2014, when the people start asking also uh, other organizations about what was going on with that rate of, of, of people that were killed in, in combat, a way to say it, uh, uh, there was informed that there were no, no statistics, no register on that, on that information. So we have here in Mexico also an institution that is uh, um, that is for for accountability for 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 people well for yeah for common citizens to know what is going on and we are able anywhere as a as a citizen as a citizen uh, we are able to ask what is going on with uh, our institution so that that institution that is called INAI. Uh, that is the Institution for Transparency and Accountability, and uh, they say that the authorities are, are obliged to to register how many people is being killed on these events, and uh, so they 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 have to they ha because that's it's an important thing. These kind of register are being are, are are held by military force because they are supposed to lead this kind of operatives and this kind of operations uh, against criminal groups. So and there is a lack of transparency of what is going on. 
So, uh, yeah, I think that's why I think, and I just said it's a complex problem because it's a lack of also of transparency and accountability of certain authorities here in, in Mexico. So, yeah, that's like the, the context. Yeah, thank you very much. Mm. Uh, Andrew, please. Uh, many people could maybe think that while we are talking about Mexico and the problems uh, uh, about Mexico, Mexico has with uh, militarization and violence, many people could maybe think that it's something related to um, national mentality or some specific historical context of the country. Uh, but I understood that uh, there are probably also some structural or systemic reasons behind that. So do you think that uh, uh, this is more about, more, more about the guns uh, that are driving police and the society to militarization or is it like also something else? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I think, um, I think we, we can kind of see forms of police militarization and militarized policing taking place all over the world in different contexts and in different ways. Um, in all sorts of different countries, in every region. So I think um, even if it looks different in some countries and perhaps more extreme in others um, because of the context, like I don't think you can say it's like about any particular kind of mentality in any country if that even exists. <laughs> so um, um, I think it's really hard to say what's driving it, but I think um, it's really important also to say like this is nothing new, like there's been forms of oppressive state violence in different ways, in different contexts, all over the world for a really long time. Um, and um, I think a, a really interesting example of that, which which kind of persists, is um, in Canada, where uh, the, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police were formed in the early 1900s, I think, um, spe specifically to kind of subjugate and, um, I, I guess, kind of con control the Indigenous people in, in Canada at the time, as kind of Canada was being formed as a nation. Um, and that continues, that that specific unit still exists and continues to have that role and is still being used to kind of um, enforce um, extractivist projects and build pipelines across First Nation land and things like this. So um, I think for me, what I see is kind of driving militarised policing in a really general way, kind of painting with a very broad brush is a preference to sustain, um, I guess, economic systems and unjust social relationships and, um, I guess, norms in society that aren't just. And so you need to use, to sustain those kind of structures, you need to use some sort of um, force or violence because um, otherwise people will continue to kind of demand their rights and uh, push against those systems and uh, we're seeing that all over the world all the time um, people kind of standing up for their rights or standing up for like social justice and the state is in turn responding with violence because the structural change that's been demanded isn't possible within their kind of worldview I guess um, Yeah, and we're seeing that in all sorts of different contexts. So we're seeing that in the USA, like really vividly with the Black Lives Matter movement and things like this. And then uh, at War Resistance International, we're doing quite a bit of work on Indonesia, in particular with West Papua, where, again, state violence, whether it's kind of the, the police or the military, and in some ways, for the people of West Papua, there's not much difference <laughs> between those two um, um, structures. Um, they've been heavily used to kind of oppress West Papuans there. So, um, yeah, I think if you're trying to sustain unjust social relationships, then you will end up using force in some way. Um, yeah, is that, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
Uh, we also have some audience here, so uh, I will have one more question for Hannah now, and I want to send this message to the audience that after this question, uh, we can switch to the questions we receive from the audience. So it's time to send it so we can receive it and, and uh, prepare for them. And before that, uh, there is uh, my question for Hannah. And I would like to know um, what you can say or how you uh, think about what could be done on political and structural level to prevent uh, the negative outcomes of arms trade? Because uh, it's uh, quite for sure that we cannot switch off uh, this kind of business from day to day. And uh, if there is gonna be some kind of change, it will be probably some slow steps and yeah. How, how, how do you think uh, in your organization or other networks you work with uh, about these challenges? Thank you for the question. I think it's uh, pretty tricky, uh, but uh, nevertheless, I would also like to uh, um, react for what uh, Montserrat and Andrew said uh, in by answering this question, actually. Uh, I would say that uh, we couldn't prevent the causes of uh, the violence uh, by following our rules we uh, already assigned to, uh, which um, uh, is the mentioned arms trade treaty, but also the common position. Um, which uh, we got inside uh, inside of uh, the EU and uh, which uh, has uh, eight criteria of how uh, should member states uh, uh, on, or under which conditions should member states export the uh, arms and uh, military equipment to another countries. And uh, usually, uh, we find that we are not following uh, not only one, but more of these criteria by issuing arms to the countries uh, elsewhere. Also interesting, and, and the fact which is, uh, 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 which is also um, good to mention is that, for example, Indonesia, which Andrew has mentioned, uh, was our biggest exporter in 2019. Mm. Yes, so <laughs> we are not really following our own uh, rules. And th this is, I, I would say, one of the problems. Uh, another pro problem I would uh, say that is that uh, uh, the uh, lobby of the arms industry is really uh, huge and uh, and the Ministry of Defense are really uh, uh, usually adoring the uh, arms from the Czech Republic. So, for example, uh, last month uh, there was started a campaign uh, to promote uh, Czech uh, arms dealers or Czech uh, uh, arms companies. Uh, and this campaign was uh, really supported by the Ministry of Defense, where the deputy of the ministry himself was like the moderator of the uh, videos which are promoting uh, actually Czech weapons. And the aim is to, uh, to uh, sell even more. Uh, actually, our arms exports from Czech Republic are growing, but still we need to support them from the institutional uh, point of view, which is, I would say, weird. And also from the January 2021, there will be a new ag agency supporting the uh, arms exports, uh, uh, mainly government to government. Uh, uh, yeah, so, <laughs> so they have really big institutional support and on the other hand there is no responsibility 
the, when we sell arms uh, somewhere, uh, we don't we don't have any responsibility. The government uh, takes no responsibility. What's happen? What's happening with with the arms uh, during the next year or during next ten years? <laughs> That's imagine inimaginable in now. But I would say that this this is what needs to be said. That we need to take responsibilities, full responsibility for what our arms cause. cause. And uh, another, uh, and I would like to mention uh, also the case of Egypt, where we, uh, or Czech Republic, <laughs> exported uh, uh, almost around, let's say, around uh, uh, 100,000 uh, firearms. Uh, I said around because we don't have uh, like exact data for that. Uh, from uh, Česká zbrojovka or CZ Group already mentioned that uh, they are uh, selling uh, arms to Mexico. Uh, and uh, these arms were meant to be used to fight the terror. Yes. But uh, actually what we the, the main uh, exports were during uh, 2013 and 2014. And from that time, what we see in Egypt is that terror is not really oppressed, but uh, who is oppressed are uh, human rights activists, lawyers, uh, bloggers, journalists, etc. And uh, that the human rights uh, crisis is really... Uh, picking in Egypt. So uh, our arms really didn't make uh, their own, their job, how it was meant, maybe by the government, or I don't know who uh, imagined that uh, it would help the situation. But uh, yeah, that's the situation. And the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, which is from Czech Republic, uh, the one who should uh, really uh, look on the licensing, uh, on the licenses we are providing for the arms dealers, uh, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, can say, okay, to this country, this is not really good to export because of uh, the human rights violations or another uh, another problems in the country. Uh, they really, in a, most of cases, they are. Uh, quiet because uh, really they want to more um, uh, promote the, or support the industry and they want to actually uh, take care of human rights of people elsewhere and I would say this is the main problem no responsibility and no following our own rules we already uh, accepted yeah, um, that was pretty clear. Uh, we've received uh, one question for you specifically. Uh, it is whether you could elaborate more on Czech exports to Mexico or Latin America or elsewhere. So I think you've mentioned something about this, but maybe there's more you would, you would uh, add, Hannah. Yeah, I already mentioned uh, the arms exports to Mexico in the beginning. Uh, uh, actually, I don't have now here prepared data for Latin America, uh, but elsewhere I already mentioned the countries which are, uh, we see as a problematical as Egypt, Turkey, Nigeria, United Arab Emirates, Vietnam, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, Indonesia. Uh, also, there is some. There was some uh, exports to Azerbaijan, uh, which were not really legal. But <laughs> some, some, and but uh, till now we don't uh, we don't know uh, if there was any circumstances coming from uh, the investigating of this um, exports to Azerbaijan. Uh, yeah. So, but. Uh, for the Mexico, I can also mention that uh, uh, 
paradoxically the uh, uh, the rifle which was uh, acquired in 2014 for Mexican police, uh, which is uh, CZ 805 Bren, uh, was uh, by Czech army um, uh, uh, not really welcomed and uh, they said it, it has really low quality and this is a really low quality assault rifle and uh, Czech army after four years of using it is uh, switching to another type. So <laughs> I would say this is a, like interesting uh, uh, issue. And um, if you want to know more about uh, in which uh, st Mexican states uh, there is uh, Czech weapons present, I I can state that in, uh, and sorry for my uh, Spanish, I really don't speak <laughs> it now since, since I, I would like to, but I don't. In Oaxaca, o, o, <laughs> please. <laughs> Sorry, Oaxaca, maybe. Uh, there is uh, uh, 2,500 uh, uh, handguns, uh, which they get uh, uh, before 2011. In uh, Michoacan, uh, there is uh, 1,000, almost 1,050. 500, uh, also nine millimeters handguns, uh, also also before 2011 in Veracruz, uh, there is uh, also nine uh, millimeter pistols, uh, which were the in exported before 2012, uh, and also they acquisit some submachine guns in 2014. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, in uh, Jalisco, Jalisco uh, the municipal police uh, implicated uh, and alleged extrajudicial murder in uh, July 2020. Uh, and they are obtained uh, 104 uh, weapons in 2009. So they have some, some of them in this uh, concrete uh, municipality. So, but uh, actually I'm really not the expert on uh, Mexico and uh, only what I can tell is the data we, we got from uh, uh, official uh, of official uh, tables, and this is also the problem that uh, um, that the ministry uh, which issues the tables about the Czech exports uh, are pretty unclear. Usually, we, we are not able to identify how many firearms or if it was even our firearms were exported. What we see is value. And uh, and also the uh, sorry, sorry for my English I forgot uh, and also the type of, of the um, is it a category yeah yeah, yeah category category thank you uh, we only see the category and in this category there's there can be. Uh, uh, firearm or just uh, some uh, uh, equipment for it, or it, it really varies. So we don't know, we don't know exactly what uh, what they are ordering from these uh, official uh, official materials we get. What we know is what, for example, Česká zbrojovka uh, is uh, really like putting in, in their PR. So, for example, we know that they are, uh, their exports are really growing rapidly during this year. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. So, if uh, that was not enough for our audience, uh, uh, you are still invited. Uh, I mean, our audience is still invited to uh, send their questions to our panelists. Um, now, I 
have something for um, Montserrat because I have realized that I would like to know whether you remember when it was the first time you heard about the Czech Republic and whether it was in a context with weapons or something else. When were the, was the first time that I heard of the Czech Republic? I think in, in the... <laughs> I don't know, forever, because <laughs> we'll be, uh, I study international relations at, uh, in my bachelor, so uh, I'm really close to, to history of, of, of the Belvet Revolution, of course. And also- okay, so I, was only, I was only curious whether we are famous for weapons in your country or, or <laughs> more famous for than the Velvet Revolution or uh, anything else? <laughs> no, that's a good question. Uh, no, because we are used to think that weapons came from 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 US and not from any other countries from, uh, for instance, from, from Europe. And also because we are like, well, our tourists and uh, the larger population is not aware that we are like the second um, uh, larger uh, importer from from Czech Republic uh, arms. Also, that there's a, like a huge uh, rate of, of of arms that came from from Austria, from Germany, from Israel, from Italy. From Italy, like we have like we have to keep an eye on that. But no, there is no uh, awareness of of what is going on in arms transfers because the problem has been focused on what is going on between Mexico and US because, well, we are so close and we are too related and there are uh, some kind of, of, of events such as uh, Fast and Furious operation that has led to like, there, there is a huge uh, guessing of what was going on with those arms and what and um, if that also allowed to increase violence armed violence here in mexico mm -hmm. so that's why we like well here in mexico is not awareness of what is going on uh, far beyond what is going on in us and i think it's important to know that for instance europe has a much broader uh, approach of 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 how to how to address human rights by human rights violence and human rights um uh like the whole uh system of human rights and how to be addressed and i think uh and it's related and also it's like really really accurate on on the relation among human rights and weapons and human rights and, and, and transfer of, of gun arms. So, yeah, no, it, there is no awareness. And I think it's important to like to promote this kind of, of events and also to promote this kind of dialogues among uh, also our authorities because they don't have like... A goal. Uh, uh, apart from what is noted on the on the news and by the journalists, the specialized journalists, there is no any kind of, of, of information of what is going on here, and that it's not like a um, and and events that are uh, like just one in a t once in a in a time uh, line events, but. Uh, they are like the whole context of what is going on here in Mexico. And there are so many other recommendations from international uh, organisms by the UN uh, also of, of what is going on. I think they can make an, any kind of, of reference to that. But uh, that's, yeah, I think it's important from us to, to, to start like this kind of dialogues among civil society and authorities and uh, and journalists of what is going on and what is the importance of, of arms transfer from, from Europe and also from this, uh, as, as Hannah say, sometimes we think like Czech Republic is a, a small country, but it's not in terms of what, uh, what are the dynamics uh, develop around some, uh, some kind of regions around the world. Yeah, thank you. Um... Andrew, are, are you here with us? <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Hi. Yeah, good. 
Well, what do you think? Is armed, armed police always bad? Or uh, are there also positive case studies uh, where police is disarmed or completely cancelled and the place is still peaceful? Mm. Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, <laughs> You, you said armed police, and I think we, we prefer to talk about militarized police because just to kind of make a distinction there, partly because you can have, I think, militarized approaches to policing, which aren't necessarily using like military grade weapons. Of course, in some contexts, that's the case, but in others, um, it's not. Um, and when I got your question, I kind of, I wasn't actually sure of any examples of kind of the police being like fully disarmed or, or cancelled. But one that came to mind was um, in South Africa in, after when apartheid ended, uh, there was a, an attempt to kind of demilitarize the police. And um, in apartheid, there wasn't much distinction between like the standing military and the, the police force, but they tried to separate those and they um, they changed the name to the, the South African Police Service, for example, to try and give some like sense that the police meant to serve, not oppress and um, they removed military ranks from the police force so uh, I'm not sure what they called like the different ranks but they stopped them having the same um, names as the military and again in attempts to kind of distinguish between those um, but from my understanding that that process kind of actually started to be reversed and um, like recently they uh, they took on the, the military ranks of the police of the military let me start again. The police took the military ranks naming structure again and um, the, the South African police continued to be kind of very oppressive and militarised and used as a kind of domineering kind of force, especially kind of towards poorer folk in, in South Africa. Um, so that's kind of the one example I came across when I got your question. I think that the other thing that will be really interesting to watch is, is the defund the police movement in the USA, which... Um, kind of following the Black Lives Matter protests has kind of really grown. And um, from my understanding, like some um, local governments have kind of um, made some promises around um, defunding the police forces in their areas. There's kind of, there's a lot of technicality around it. Um, and there's kind of lots of questions about how far that's going to go. Um, but I think that will be a kind of really interesting process to watch as um, activists there really push for like a systemic change to how directly to how the police forces are funded and the equipment they have access to and um, yeah those those kind of pro processes um, uh, just another example from the US I was just thinking about is um, I understand there's the systems for uh, the military to um, sell at very low cost um, prices equipment that the military no longer needs to police forces, which is why you see in some contexts like um, police forces use driving around in like military grade um, like trucks, like kind of bomb bomb proof and mine proof trucks, and using kind of assault rifles and I th like they even had like access to like grenade launchers and all this other kind of crazy equipment that you can't believe why a police force would ever need that, but then gets used later because they have access to it. Um, I understand like under Obama, there were some attempts to kind of de um, to change that process, so so they had less access to some equipment. And under Trump, those systems were changed, so police forces had more access to more militarized equipment again. So again, I, d I don't know enough about U.S. politics either, uh, but it'd be interesting to see whether we did and whether that kind of changes again. So yeah, that that's kind of my comment on that. Yeah, good. Um, a short uh, note to our audience. Uh, we are 15 minutes uh, till the end of our session. So last chance for your questions. Um, but I will have something for Hannah now because you've been uh, participating in a campaigning against uh, arms trade for quite some years already. And from what I understand, it's really hard work and not, uh, not that fruitful. But I was interested, interested uh, in whether 
uh, you've ever had some surprising ally in your uh, work on a political level or anywhere else? Or are you s all the time in a position of uh, strong disagreement with these official structures? Can you think about anything like that? Well, <laughs> that, that's the question. Um, yeah, actually, I would say that the, the things, I, I would say it's, uh, it improves uh, in the terms that um, we get more allies than we used to in the past. But also the uh, arms industry is uh, uh, taking advantages of the new technologies. And as I said, uh, they are also getting better <laughs> within uh, uh, getting their allies uh, as they got to the Ministry of Defense uh, recently. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I, I would say that Everything professionalized, but uh, our uh, 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 but uh, but we uh, had uh, limited, uh, um, I would say, uh, well, ba basically, imagine we are the group of volunteers. <laughs> Opposing the arms industry of Czech Republic, which uh, in 2019 had uh, uh, the exports of uh, 619 million euros value of uh, arms and uh, and other uh, military equipment. So uh, yeah, if somebody there hears us and uh, wants to be our ally, <laughs> I would appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> you are right. Uh, this is the opportunity to invite other people to cooperate with you. So I've got a question for Montserrat. And the question is, um, what do you expect would happen if Mexico would legalize drugs uh, or some drugs in the context of uh, violence and militarization? Well, oh, actually, there is uh, an, there is now a proposal in the legislative uh, in the legislative body to legalize some kind of uh, some 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 kind of drugs, uh, but not its use. And it's important that because it's a different approach of what is going on. We are not like only we are not like only consumers, but also sellers, and also to to all, all other places in the world. It's not just about like legalizing, uh, having drug in your home or having to produce it. The, like the whole market, like to legalize all the, uh, the, the market. Also, I have a, a specific um, number from 2017 to 2019. It, was a, it has been an increase on um, people that has been detained and has been investigated by possessing drugs, but also uh, uh, the, uh, it was an increase of 87, 88% of people that has been detained for possessing any kind of drugs. So, but it's important to know that these kind of cases that are investigated are for 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 personal like. Uh, the possession of drugs are for personal use, not for like a huge amounts of of of, of shipment. So it's important, like, to change the change the vision also, and to stop criminalizing people that uh, that are that use drugs. And I think um, the 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 proposal that is now in the legislative body. It's kind of a tricky one because it allows like some some specific enterprises to, to produce and to to do like to have the whole market of certain kind of drugs, and also uh, states 
uh, uh, still criminalizing like the smaller uses and the smaller processors of drugs. So uh, I think we need like a change of perspective. Also, it has been like promote here in Mexico has been promoted like a different kind of tribunals that must that must uh, follow these cases in order to to help people out of, of, of their conditions, not only as 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 problematic users, but also as, as uh, if they are linked with other kind of like, criminal activities. So I think it's important like to change the approach of why we why we need to legalize like certain 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 markets of, of, of drugs uh, uh, and under under what circumstances they must be legalized. And also, who are what is the main target, and what are the main purposes of those of those kind of politics? Because if it's like there's a, a very little amount of people that it's been judged uh, that has been judged for this for these crimes for like possessing, and also it's because like the huge like the huge mafia it's not been touched, you know. Uh, only like uh, the 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 users, so I think we need to change that approach, and I think uh, that will help help also if we don't like help the big companies and the big uh, industries and uh, and the big uh, to monopolize the whole market. If we like give it the right approach, it might help to reduce violence here in Mexico, but it's at also, I think it's a kind of a of a topic of 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 uh, a whole construction of of the society because society also allows to to users to be criminalized by authorities. It's not just by the legislation, you know. I mean, it's, I, it's kind of a culture thing, a culture I think. So yeah, it might need like a huge review of how this oppression needs to be done. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we have last seven minutes and there is a question for Hannah. Uh, are you with us? Yeah, uh, the locals. Yeah, so the local xenophobic and populist party SPD in the Czech Republic called uh, for arms embargo to Turkey in reaction to war in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, what do you think is their motivation? Well, I would say that uh, they are now only one uh, who are raising the topic of uh, the arms exports uh, <laughs> now, uh, because uh, the uh, yeah, I, I would say that the parties who are the uh, members of the government don't want to uh, interact with this topic because it's um, pretty fragile and. Uh, I, I would say that this is like populistic view because mainly we need to admit that Czech population are peaceful people who don't like war at all. <laughs> uh, as you can see that we divided, for example, with Slovakia pretty peacefully and uh, we, friend, we are friends now. Uh, uh, and uh, we do not support uh, any kinds of war in our neighborhood, but uh, uh, but we don't see what's uh, beneath the hills, you know, like far, far away is for us really uh, far. So, but I would say that uh, the war in Nagorno-Karabakh is, um, uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it seems by, by these uh, populists, uh, as the opportunity to uh, ev to avoid the uh, Islam Islam uh, <laughs> to uh, somehow um, in yeah, like like this uh, I would say that they see this uh, uh, fight as the Islam uh, against the Christian so. Uh, that's why they support uh, the arms embargo for Turkey, and uh, yeah, uh, this is not really our motivation <laughs> for uh, 
inviting the Minister of Foreign Affairs to stop the exports. Yeah, um, because we are almost uh, at the end of our session, I would like to ask all three of you whether you want to react on something you heard uh, during our session from other panelists, or is there anything you've got to say now? Just don't hesitate to... Um, <laughs> I also wanted to remark what this kind of said about narratives, uh, what is shared among the population from the authorities, uh, what is the, like, what is the perspective that must be, at, uh, like, emphasized or of, of, of the paper, like, the role of of, of, of the authorities and the state and all that, because that was allowed also to, like, to to still spreading like this kind of vision of armed violence and also it, it applies here in Mexico because I also think like there is an approach that uh, well we will lend uh, this like this violence with the help of these armed institutions that and it's kind of weird because that is in the first place the strategy that led to the the increases of, of homicide rates and also the violence uh, within the civil population. Uh, it, and I think it's important to to know that these kind of narratives are, are, are kind of uh, fallacies and also the, uh, the spread among, uh, like civil population is buying in. And I think it's important to like, Every time we can, we can remark that because that is a vicious cycle that it will be repeated all over again if we don't try to 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 propose another kind of approach. And also, uh, also, I want to note what uh, Andrew said about. And I'm 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 not I'm not gonna get tired of of saying that about uh, social justice. I think it's important, and it's not important just like. Uh, saying that kind of messages, I, I try to like we have to focus on poverty and, and poor people because that's not all. That's not only the problem. The problem is like we have like a bias on how uh, of 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 how civilian population at a large is uh, is persist. Uh, we have like discriminatory approaches uh, around, uh, for instance, in Mexico, it's it's about uh, migrants, it's about women, it's about pe people with disabilities. Uh, they are the people that are, are most in danger because there is no a certain policy, and also they are uh, uh, this like generalized violence that it's happening here it also affects us in a different way. So it's important for us to spread like any, uh, uh, another kind of approaches, another kind of proposals. Um, I, I'm, I'm really close to this like feminist uh, approach of what has to be done, it has to be done here in, uh, to, to address violence here in Mexico. And it's not only about spreading that this course of, of we, we are trying to look after poor people or or old people it's about how this kind of, of phenomenon affects us in a differentiated way uh, every kind of population i think that was a nice um closing speech thank you for that um but i don't as we are talking about uh, weapons and uh, violence here i don't want to uh, stop this violently and if there's still something you the rest of you uh, want to add to what Monserrat have just said, uh, please go, go ahead before I close this session. Yes, maybe uh, I just want to shortly add that if we want a really peaceful society, and I mean not only in our nation, no borders, but like globally, we really need to stop thinking that uh, the militarization is helping us to uh, get the secure and peaceful society. I would say that 
this is should be essential. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Andrew? Last last sentence. <laughs> I, I, I was just kind of thinking like how important it is that we kind of challenge like the this being like normal, this level of violence and militarization, like that it's not and it's not normal for most people. And actually it's a very tiny number of people with a lot of power for whom it is normal and it is like the correct approach to solve problems. Like we're like incredibly good at solving problems and conflicts without resorting to violence in our everyday lives. We do it all the time. Um so like there has to be other ways to to, to kind of to address the kind of problems that I will face as other than like highly militarized violence. And that seems like so obvious it should go without saying, but it's not the case because it's so common to have this kind of level of violence in countries around the world. So yeah, I don't know where you go with that, but it just seems important to say. Yeah. But I'd, I'd like to say thanks to Monster for that kind of summary because it was really like, yeah, really yeah. clear. Um, thank you. So yeah. Uh... Thank you, everybody uh, from uh, England, right? From Mexico, from the Czech Republic. And uh, thank you, uh, Rosa Luxemburg uh, Foundation for organizing this and for having us. Um, if there is uh, among the listeners uh, somebody who would like to join campaigning about uh, against uh, militarization and arms trade, do not hesitate uh, to get into contact with Nesehnutí, uh, Czech NGO, and also other organizations here in your countries. I think that will be listed somewhere on, on Facebook, uh, if you're watching us through Facebook. Uh, yeah. I hope I have not forgotten to say anything. So good evening to everybody. Good, uh, uh, not morning, but have a good rest of the day. Uh, <laughs> anywhere you are. And Nesehnuti uh, also uh, published a publication about arms. Uh, this year, I am informed here uh, in our chat. So uh, I hope we will have a link for this publication on Facebook so anybody can download and read this. Yeah. So have, uh, thank you again. Have fun and a lot of success with your work.